If you enjoy our original content, please consider becoming a supporter on Anchor so that we can continue to bring you laughs every week. The following program may contain immature situations, themes, and is intended for an adult audience. The opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of everyone else working on the show. Viewer discretion is advised. Wow. wow. Welcome to the Danny McDermott Show. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our uh, season finale. <laughs> season finale. I can't even believe it. This is, is this 39 or 40, Kevin? Uh, it'd be one of those two. <laughs> we haven't even done enough research to know that on our own we, show. We look forward, Danny. We keep moving forward. <laughs> Dude, what a year it has been. We've done two yeah. seasons. We during COVID we were doing this. That's how we created this show. We have we have had so many amazing guests on the show. Um we just want to thank everybody who's watched the show, everybody who continues to watch, everybody who should uh we actually have people who donate uh which if we can run that ticker if you guys want to donate, we sure could use your money. We've been working our butts off, and we're going to continue to do so. But this is our season finale, and we are very grateful. I'm grateful for everybody who's helped with the show, and uh, except for Kevin. And uh, no, I'm kidding. Well, if they donate money, I don't have to risk a sunburn out by that exit on the highway holding that sign. <laughs> yes, Kevin sells roses on Interstate uh, 87. <laughs> Hi, have you made much money on that, Kevin? Six bucks <laughs> for the year. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> mm. That's fuck you money where I come from. It's you know I love that I'm we're doing this finale at uh, John Lennon's old mansion. You know what I mean? I love this. I uh, I've been out in LA for the last month and a half doing these shows. I'm very excited having meetings. We're going to be making some movies. I'm very excited. Uh, this show is going to be, in fact, Kevin, I don't know if I told you about this, but my friend who's doing a show surviving sunset, a movie, uh, that's going to be released next year, um, uh, may feature footage from our show because we interviewed him on the show. Nice. Isn't that cool? I thought you were going to ask me to play Norma Desmond. <laughs> no, you play that every day, Kevin. We didn't need lines, Danny. We had faces. <laughs> I, I'm just, I just want to thank everybody who's been on the show. I can't even believe we've had people from Cobra Kai. We've had people from uh, the, the Sopranos. We've had people from uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Greg Proops, Robert Fanaro. Uh, you know, uh, we've had uh, writers from the Ferguson show, John Reynolds. Um, Eddie Beth Brill. Selling, huh? Eddie Brill. Eddie Brill from the Letterman show. And a, a guy from exit nine on I-87. We had that yep. too. <laughs> Brian Panovich, uh, Panovich from bestselling author. Uh, Eddie Burke from the improv. Uh, who else? Uh, Al Ducharme from two dicks, which is a <laughs> detective. <laughs> um, just to be clear on that. Jason just Hawkins was our first guest, wasn't he? Yes. We also had Mary Kennedy, uh, Genevieve Ledoux. We've had uh, legendary Rick Shapiro. Rick Shapiro. 
Gory Kahaney, Mary Kennedy, Scott Krinsky from Chuck, Perry Kurtz, who I love dearly, Carrie Louise, David Lockhart, uh, Ben Morrison, it just it Henry Phillips. I mean, Deepak, uh, Kayla Ray. Uh, I mean, it's Ron Thomas Tom from Cotter. Tom Cotter. How could you forget Tom Cotter? I mean, we can't mention everybody, but you know what? Let's do this as a thank you to everyone who's been on the show. Let's show the thank you video we, that uh, Susanna, uh, our producer, has uh, worked up for us. Let's do that. Dude, I just wanted to rap during that. I wanted to do a rap, rap song. <laughs> if we have connection issues with you, Danny, I'm going to do Wu Tang the musical where I pay I play all nine members of Wu Tang. <laughs> Shaolin, baby. Dude, I'm so grateful. Oh, that was written by Deepak, by the way, the music uh, from Robot Nature, who was on last week's show live. Uh, so that's so cool that we used that from last week. He's going to love that. Um, Susanna, you probably told him already. Susanna, did you tell him? Come on. You're, you're, you're part of this. Come here. Yes. I'm so grateful. I, seriously, Susanna, I'm so grateful for all the hard work you've done this year. And... Uh, You've done, you've gone above and beyond, and you you continue to do so, and we're grateful. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Susanna. And I did not, and I did not tell him that his song was going to be used on that tonight. That's, so that's okay. That's okay. He <laughs> he loves me. It's fine. Um, and that was just that was just the riff he did, right? That was. Yep. He completely riffed that. So that was so cool. So. Uh, Susanna, so Susanna, why don't you tell people what you're working on? So tonight is a season finale of No Cover with Nancy Hills. It is mm -hmm. on Comcast Channel 27 in Albuquerque, but it's also premiering at 8.30 on YouTube and Facebook. So if you want to check that out, No Cover with Nancy Hills, 8.30. There you go. Thanks. And, and oh, you were, what else? And so Rise of Seekly. Sikale is the band that's going to be performing tonight. And they used to be the drummer and guitarist for Femme Fatale back in the eighties. So that's exciting. And then I also have a movie Volts coming out. It's a Hungarian movie. Uh, Wave films is putting it out and that should be out by Halloween. And you wrote Sandy, it. Yes. I wrote the screenplay and Sandy Johnson, who is also on our show. She was a surprise guest. Um, she is on that movie. She makes a cameo. Yeah. Susanna, why don't you tell everybody how how did you get into screenwriting and entertainment? Because you were you were worked for HP, right? I did. I was a business analyst, and I met up with Angela. Angela worked with me. Angela Joseph worked yep. with me at HP, and she started your show. And wow, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> she started your show with you, I guess. She I was going to say, you, right? <laughs> so yeah, she talked you into it. And no, it was she's. A good decision. she's yeah, she she's uh, she I, you know I, I definitely got to thank her for pushing me to do the show for sure. Um, so then you got into you met her and then how did you get into screenwriting? So she just posted that she needed a uh, she was producing a movie and I was like oh that's so cool let me know if I could help. She said do you want to write the screenplay? <laughs> and you had never written a screenplay before. No, never. But well, I had in high school. You know, high school drama. Okay. I lettered in drama. I'm in the International Thespian Society. So I <laughs> know a little bit. I could write a little bit. So, yeah, it should be out by Halloween. I'm excited for it. I'm very excited for you as well. Don't you have another screenplay you've been working on too? I can't talk about that one yet. Okay, okay. You okay. have. This is the finale, so we're going to have a little bit of a hiatus. Do you have anything you're working on during the hiatus? I, oh, actually, I do. I have this new show called Junkyard Brewery. And there's a teaser on my YouTube page that you can watch it. And it's kind of Breaking Bad slash Fast and the Furious kind of thing. And awesome. that's nice. coming soon. Well, let me tell you about my exciting news. 
What's up? I am going to get a pair of pants, and I'm debating between tan <laughs> and navy. And if people donate enough money, I'll get both. I don't even care. <laughs> that sounds great, Kevin. Please Thank donate you. for Kevin's pants. Please. I'm leaning towards the navy, just to be clear. <laughs> Please donate for Kevin's pants. If you have any comments as to what kind of pants Kevin should wear, please put them in the comments and, and maybe we can guide him because his fashion Chino. sense is worse than mine. Chino. I'll, I'll create a poll. <laughs> That's a good idea. Let's create a poll for a uh, poll for Kevin's. That didn't sound right at all. Let's create a poll for Kevin's pants. <laughs> That's funny. You give me a poll to dance on and I bet you I could get a couple of shirts too. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to see you pole dance, Kevin. No offense. Uh, you know what? <laughs> there's probably not a big market for it, Danny. But don't you kid yourself. I think there's like there's, no market, Kevin. <laughs> there, no, there is nothing out there that has no market. Nothing. <laughs> You're right. You could probably get famous that way. I'm probably totally off base. <laughs> so if you want to see Kevin Fitzgerald pole dance, please put it in the comments and donate. And we will start his pole dancing lessons within the next three weeks. <laughs> Hey, if anybody donates two thousand dollars plus airfare, they can get a lap joke. There you a go. lap joke. All right, all right. <laughs> we we got to get this show moving. I'm very excited for our our first guest tonight. I've been friends with this guy a long time. I met him when I was uh, uh, I was uh, uh, at Dimples uh, Karaoke Bar as a regular, and he was working there. And then we became friends and. He started making these movies. I, I went to his premieres and stuff, and he's just he's just a badass, and he makes things happen, and he works harder harder than almost anybody I know I've ever known in my life. Uh, he's a he's a writer, producer, director based in Southern California, from Chicago. He's a co-founder of Badger Films and the founder of Tornado Park Films. Please welcome Joshua Wagner, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Woo! <laughs> Welcome. What's up? What's up? Thank you for being on the show, man. Thank you for putting me on the finale. What am I doing on the finale? I don't know because you're driving, and I'm it worried you're, like gonna, you're doing about 35 gonna... miles an hour. Oh, I'm not driving. I'm being driven by my driver. Oh, Look, thank there God. He is. Thank God. Yeah. I was worried we were, we were going to have a finale accident. No, no, no. I, I, I wanted to do this uh, proper way on a on a laptop, but I had an issue with my rental car, um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, they don't give them laptops anymore. At the yeah, they don't. <laughs> they, they don't let you drive and they don't let you drive on your while well, you're on your laptop anymore. You know, what's funny. I was I, I, I'm in L.A. right now. I, I'm at John Lennon's old mansion right here. And uh, I was the other day. I this guy has laptop in his car as he was driving. And he he was at a red light and he's typing on his freaking laptop. Was it me? Was it? Was it me? Was it like a <laughs> shitty? Was it like a Toyota Corolla, like uh, a nineteen uh, ninety four? Oh my god! No. <laughs> no. In Did you say you're John Lennon's? You had you had a you had a blow up doll in the other seat for for the carpool lane. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> LA, like let me tell you, LA is, <laughs> LA is the only place where people have children just to, so they can drive in the carpool lane. Yeah. And I, and I don't, and I live there and I don't have any kids. What am I doing? What I know, am I doing? Right? You got to, you got to, you got to, you, you got to kidnap some just so you can go in the car. I didn't, I'm sorry. I, that's a bad joke. Is the blow up doll doing double duty? That may be preventing kids. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> just saying. Whoa. <laughs> Why was it? What, you were gonna say, you were gonna say something about kidnapping. Is it? We can't talk about kidnapping now. Is that a? Is that a thing too? We can't. Well, can't you know what? Kevin's got a few kids in his basement, so we really don't want to. We want to avoid that. <laughs> okay. All right. You don't want to. You don't want to lead people there. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. They're dead. Can you imagine oh. the, the red flags we have right now? Uh, the, you realize uh, people who are list have uh, Alexa. All these red flags are popping up about kidnapping right now. We're we're Ooh. we're creating some. Yeah. <laughs> we're on a few lists. Well, as soon as we hang up on my phone, there's going to be all these kidnapping. Uh, you know, like how to kidnap, what what tools you should use. You know, what kind of uh, a chloroform, funny. the best chloroform to use for. Uh, I didn't know there was a difference in chloroform quality. <laughs> yeah. 
You got to have good quality. <laughs> you, wa you want them to stay asleep for at least 15 minutes. Ransom note spell checks. <laughs> Danny, I thought you were in New York. No, I was in New York for about a year. I drove across the country to be near my son, but I'm back in L.A. now. To be honest with you, I was coming back. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And uh, I, I, I walked into the, you know, I came into the mansion. All of a sudden, these big meetings with all these big producers. And all of a sudden, they start talking about my movies. And so it looks like we're going to be doing some stuff. So I didn't expect everything to blow up like this. But now I got I to gotta go home and drive my car back across the country to make sure I'm facilitating these relationships with these producers. So it's it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody. Yeah, I mean, I think you got a strike right now because uh, uh, there's going to be a thirst for content. So yeah, now yeah. it's a good. Uh, like, uh, ironically, you know, I, for for three and a half years, I was trying to make this movie with. Uh, we had John Leguizamo attached. We had John Cusack attached, and Thomas Jane, and at one point John Hawks, and um, you know, and then COVID happened, and you know, we were supposed to shoot that in New Jersey, but then COVID happened, and then all of a sudden. You know, we wrote this script that was going to be, I guess, COVID friendly in a way to where there was less, less crew, less actors. And, uh, and we, and now we're, and, you know, and we did that because it, I guess, you know, the time, you know, ironically, it's like that happened, that, that came together quickly. And, um, and also, but, you know, the pain was that we had to have, uh, COVID compliance officer, everybody had to get their, their test every two or three days, you know. So if, as if as if filmmaking you know couldn't uh, couldn't get any harder it did but at the same time now there people are looking for content so yeah. i take those meetings if i were you and i'd, I'd take them fast dude i'm having them every day man it's crazy yeah. it's crazy uh so so what let, let's talk before we get into what you're doing now let's talk about um uh dimples dimples can we talk okay. about dimples yeah i love talking about them have you talked have you talked to sal sal is for those of you who don't know, uh, the uh, owner and creator of Dimples, a legendary, it was the first karaoke bar in this country, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, that's its claim to fame. I think 1983 or 85. And 83, what, I think. Now, you were, you, back before you were making movies, you were a bartender there. And you well, were I was making, still making movies. I just, you know, had to make money. Right, right, right. I shouldn't have said it that way. You're absolutely right. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes those things are not exclusive. No, uh, you know what's crazy? I've I've worked in telemarketing companies for 20 years now, and I, I'm sometimes I'm sitting there with celebrities next to me. I'm like, what is going on with your career? They're like, no, this is just this is what I do between movies. <laughs> oh, were you working with them? Yeah. Well, that. So does that work? Is that part of their spiel? Is that part of their script? They're like, hey, this is uh, <laughs> Chad, this is Chad Lowe, um, <laughs> Rob Lowe's brother. And, um, you know, no, I mean, uh, I, I've, 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 I've not no joke. I've, I've worked with people who have co-starred on Fresh Prince of Bel-Air for years and they're in a telemarketing company. I, you know, it's like people don't realize how hard we work and telemarketing strive. Huh? Yeah. They don't realize how hard telemarketing is. Oh God, they don't even start with that. That uh, that's brutal. But yeah, people, don't, people people don't realize. In fact, I had one friend. I'm not going to say who, but he had one of the biggest screenwriting books in the country, and he was like, "Don't tell people I work here." And he had, it was a bestseller on Amazon, and I couldn't say anything. Every ten seconds in America, a car warranty expires. What? Okay, what does that have to do with anything? Somebody's got to call you and tell you, hey, this is happening, pal. <laughs> My point is this Whoa. business is stuff. All right, let's get back to let's get back to dimples. Was it Who's John I Truby? Was it a uh, uh, Sid Field? No, I'm I'm just thinking of uh, the screenwriting books that I bought. No, uh, no, I'll tell you after the show. I can't I can't do All it. Right. He'll get mad at me. I got um, it. Uh, hey, am I looking? I'm looking at this little my little camera. Am I looking into the? Does it look like I'm looking at at you guys, or does it look like my eyes are somewhere? Oh, else? you look great. I mean, I'm not. Great. I'm not. Look at. I'm. My eyes aren't looking at the camera. I, right, because you're looking at. Yeah. I'm looking at you're you right. guys. I want to look at you I'm guys. I'm looking at. Because I feel I like I'm talking you. to you. Then. 
you know? I was looking at you guys, but then I was like, am I looking at these guys too much? You know, I want to. No, no, just look, look at around. us. <laughs> look at us, man. We, we, we want to be adored. We want to be looked at. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> What's this in the background? Dracula. What is that? Uh, oh, so, yeah. So this is like a $250,000 freaking poster of the original movie. I'm, I'm, I'm literally in John Lennon's old mansion. So uh, there's all kinds of crazy movie paraphernalia here. When you get back into town, come over and I'll, I'll show you around. I'll introduce you to, to the owners. What do you mean? You like live in there? Uh, yeah, I've been living there. Yeah. I mean, I'm friends with the producer, so he lets me stay here. Um, you know, I'm like his many- brother, you know? So, uh, wow. he, just, he just heard me. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> and he, and he, he lives there in moratorium. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've been wow. blessed to have good friends who like, you know, <laughs> are, are yeah. saving my ass. Most well, of you're, gre- you're gregarious. You're gregarious. You're out there, you know, you're smoozing. You're not like, like, see me, man. I just, I just, I just like stay inside and write. And then I'll like, you know, and I quit drinking some years ago. So I'll go out and socialize, but I don't, you know, not as much, you know, because old duels can only, you know, you can only drink so many old duels, <laughs> you know? Well, you were always super cool to me at Dimples, man. Um, and then we became friends and then you drove me. I remember you drove me home and your wouldn't at that time, your windows wouldn't close. <laughs> you remember that? that was the door. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was my, uh, my Dodge Intrepid. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, it was one window. Yeah. And then, so one, w- one door didn't open from the inside. Uh, then, then that, but then the, but the window rolled down. So I had to open it from the outside. Then that window stopped working. At one point the I had to put a football when I would stop the car, I'd have to put a football under the, under the brake. So the brake lights wouldn't stay on, you know, when I park <laughs> and you That's know what, awesome. it's just, it, and then that problem just went away. Like uh, one day it stopped. One day I didn't have to put the football there again. I was like, see, it worked. <laughs> you know, it you were talking about crazy cars. I had a headlight that would keep falling out. And like, so I, I was on the highway one night and the, the headlight fell out and it was pointing right in the windows of every car next to me. So everybody thought I was a cop. <laughs> So I'd like drive nice. up on them and the, the light would be shining in their face. They were like looking oh, going up. And I was all I could do was laugh because there was nothing <laughs> I could do until I got off the exit. <laughs> but it was shining literally right at the driver's side window, and the people were like, "Oh, oh my man. god, what's going? What, what, what am I doing wrong?" <laughs> oh man, yeah. I mean, in LA, it's hard. To, it's hard to get by. Sometimes I drove a car with no AC in it for I don't know, five years. Same oh, car. Yeah, that's. Horrible. I was like twelve hundred bucks to fix it. I'm like, ah, you know, I couldn't afford it at the time. You got a little fan with ice suffered. next to you. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, said, a little, yeah, fan. little fan with ice, a ice bucket next yeah. to you. A little uh, swamp cooler. <laughs> All right, I want I, I before we go into your you're totally into your stuff. I want to give a tribute to Sal because I miss him. I'm gonna call him soon. Thanks for giving me his number, by the way. Oh yeah, yeah. Who's, Is that the right number? I don't know. What I don't I haven't checked yet. But what famous people have sung at Dimples? Uh. Let's see here. Well, we there was uh, I know Katy Perry was in there. Um, obviously Dennis Haskins lived there. <laughs> Mr. Belding from Saved by the Bell. Fit, fit Fifty Cent. He was really? in there. Wow. Yeah, Fifty Cent. Um, man, that well, there were some uh, the Killers, the lead singer from the Killers. Bro, I can't remember his name. He was in there, but he that doesn't count because he's a singer. Right, right, you know, right. Um, the, oh, the, who else was in there? The cast of the uh, big, the cast of the Big Bang Theory was there. Yeah, oh yeah. Well, they, yeah, they actually, they were pretty much right. They came in every Monday. Yeah, they came in like on a slow night. Yeah, Simon Helberg or Halberg, Halberg and uh, the Indian guy. Yeah, they were in there. Yep. We, um, you know, the, you know the girl who played Bernadette. The oh yeah, yeah. With the glasses. She came in one night and uh, and I said, hey, I like your work. And she goes like this. She goes, I know you, Danny. And I go, what? She goes, we did comedy together in New York. 
And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember now. <laughs> so she remembered you, and you didn't remember her. Wow, yeah, that's a power move. I know. That's a power was, move, man. <laughs> <laughs> but she was that's a celebrity, a and her husband came up after us. He's like, she was really glad to see you. Anyway. That's cool. That's cool. Let's go into the Badger game. I went to the premiere of this. Yeah. That yeah. was, yeah. I went to the premiere of this, and uh, I had, I brought a girl from work. And um, it was funny because I just, I didn't know the girl from work that well. Very pretty girl, very nice girl. And uh, we're sitting there, and we watched, it was an amazing movie, by the way. Amazing Thank movie. You. I loved it. You did that Thank for what, 100 grand? Uh, no, it was like, it was about 65 grand. Yeah. Really? Damn, yeah. dude. Well, we go got, my partner works at Post Haste. So we got, um, we, we had some, po we had some liberties in the post, in post, uh, production, but you know, probably would have been around okay. that, but, uh, we, you know, we kind of got hooked up and we went, don't get me wrong. We went in there too. And we were, you know, I was helping out mixing, you know, doing whatever I was kind of learning you know, as they were, you know, cause I wasn't, we had the guy, we had our first editor who was Ethan Manakis and, uh, he's, he co-directed Machete and, um, he, he did the first edit and we could only pay him for like six weeks. So then I finished it and then, um, we, and then we went in and, uh, yeah, I mean, we went in, we had, we had some, uh, some really like some vets in there. We had, uh, Rick Ash who mixed like Pulp Fiction and Black Hawk Down. He did wow. the mix. And, and, and I was like so impressed by him. I, that's all I wanted to put on our poster. I wanted to put from the guy who mixed Black Hawk Down. <laughs> from, the, from the editor who directed Machete. No, from the editor who co-directed Machete comes. You know, I mean, because you, know, you just see those names, right? You see Pulp right. Fiction, Black Hawk Down, Machete. Yeah. Well, I, I was veto. I... I that, that my vote was I was outvoted on that. <laughs> you know what's funny about that night? I that that girl that I was hanging out with, I, as we were walking, um, as we were walking out of the party, you had a party at this bar. Yeah. Uh, one of the lead girls looked at me and said, "You have great eyebrows." And so I flirted with her for a second, and that girl, that girl never never would date me again after that. <laughs> Who said you had great eyebrows? Uh, the girl that I, I even told you I wanted to meet her. I forget her name. Oh, and, and the, the, one of the actresses? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I, you see, I thought the story was going somewhere else. I thought you were going to say you took this girl to see Badger Game, and she got it got her so turned <laughs> on that, like, you know, it was such a good movie. You're like, wow, man, the last date, <laughs> the last movie, my, the last movie, my date, the last movie that a friend made that my date took me to was terrible. We had to pretend we liked it. And, um, you know, and that was a turnoff. No, no, dude, look at, look at, I've been to a lot of movies premieres. They were freaking horrible, dude. I'm not going to lie. Like, like most of them were horrible. You were going to, were you going to name one? You're no, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. Not doing it. Nope. Bad habit. Don't ever talk hey. badly about anybody's movie or anybody. I know. They know tried? who they are. Anyway, yours they know was, who they are. Yours was great. Yours was great. No joke. I, I I really I was really impressed. The girl that I brought was impressed. And um yeah, no, it was a great movie. Now you Thanks. no, you're dude, you're great. I, I wish I wish we would have gotten some bigger festivals. The the one thing when I make a movie is and this is honest to truth, honest to God. The objective is to make a movie that your friends don't have to pretend they like. Right, right. That's uncomfortable, you know, when you got to like, you know, Dude, you got to pretend. Walked out, I've walked out right at, during the credits sometimes because I don't want to look my friend in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah I, I, know. Mean, I think I know. we've all yeah. done it. But you, I stayed. I was excited. I I couldn't wait to talk to you. It was, it was. Yeah, you were probably first. I think you talked to me as we, as we were walking up, who, by the way, my my partner, my co the co-director, he said, he said we're not going to say anything at the end of the movie because we're running late. We want to get to the after party. No, we're not going to say anything. So we, I went. I'm like, all right. We went up there. He, we go on stage, and he has this whole whole speech. 
He thanked everybody. He thanked everybody. He had a whole speech written. I'm like, I thought we weren't saying anything. And so, you know, I forgot to thank Kim, my girlfriend. No way. She got upset. Yeah. Oh my God. And we, and, and we filmed at her house and she was on the crew. And like, we, you know, we forgot today, but she worked out. She just worked on this one. She worked on, uh, she did like 20 jobs on this one, Turning Point. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about this yeah. movie. I you love like that. Say, hey, I'm her. pretty good. Huh? DJ Turning Point. I've, I've hung out with DJ several yeah. times. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, he, he, he used to hang out at the Oaks Tavern. I used to sing karaoke there. He still hangs there. Does he? I just got yeah, back. Well, now that it's open. Open again, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I got to say hi to him again, but I love him. He's such a sweet guy, and he's a great actor. Yeah. He's so good, much. and he was one of the easiest to – he was pretty easy, man. He was he was easy to direct. You know, he didn't um, – he had some ideas and stuff, but sometimes, you know, sometimes bigger actors, people that have been around the business a while, they're 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 a little harder to direct, especially when they know you're – you know, you, you haven't – I've done a handful of projects, but, like, you know, I, I haven't worked with many big, big actors. So he was easy. He was good. He was, he was, he was a delight. Can we put up the artwork for that movie for turning point? Do we have that? Probably um, not. Oh no, that's, go. uh, oh. there's, there's no artwork yet because it, I'm, I'm literally, literally oh. editing it at home. Like when I came home, I brought my drives. I'm editing it while I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, All right. What, we so don't what, have anything yet. What stage are you in with that movie right now? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, we, well, we just wrapped um, at the end of May. Okay. And, um, you know, we did, we, we had to, because they knew I was traveling. So I had to get all the pro ProRes files. So Tom made all ProRes. And I'm like 30 minutes into the first edit. Um, but we have a deadline, man. We have a serious deadline. We, we have to have it finished by like August. Because wow. um, it's going to be, I believe it's going to be Lionsgate. So they want to have it released in October. Um. So we, yeah, there's like, there's no break. There's no, like, we had to go right from shooting right to editing and I'm doing the editing, you know? So, which is, which is the way I prefer it because I'm going to be a lot faster. Like I, yeah, I know everything. Yeah. I know all the shots. I haven't even, I didn't even name, I haven't even named the files. I didn't give them any names. I'm just, I know <laughs> the shot. And it's like throwing them in there know, on the timeline. You time know the line. footage so well that you don't, yeah. It's fresh in my memory. Yeah. 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 No, it's funny because um, I'm 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 going a different route than you, uh, which yours is your route is better because I mean in a way because I mean you're you know everything you you know the editing you know all sides of it, and I'm go I'm at a point where I'm about to get my movie produced and I'm gonna have to trust an editor. That scares the shit out of me. You know how do you feel about that? Trusting an editor? Yeah. Well, I mean. It's it's easy if you don't how like do you, the cut. How do you choose an editor? How do you how do you what Look, what are your qualifications? I'll, I'll trust an editor over a uh, over like a DP or like you know like an AD. I mean because you can't an editor is going to cut the movie and you're going to be like you're the boss, so you're going to be like, well, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this. The footage yeah. is there. You know if you if you have a DP you don't like, all of a sudden. You know, you're, you're arguing on set. Your your things are you know slowing down. Um, you know, uh, you, or same with an AD. You know, you're going to spend time arguing. It's going to take vital. Uh, it's going to take vital um, creative energy. Editing, I think. You know, maybe you should even go sit in on some sessions. Right. You know, and it's always better. The the you got to give the editor. He's got to have script lines, and you got to give him a script. Um. So they know what they're doing and, you know, explain to them what I would do is, I mean, do you know who's editing it yet? No, probably no, not. The problem, the problem, here's the thing. So we're going for 1.2 to 1.5 million. So I got a big director and a big editor. So I'm not going to have a lot of say, you know what I mean? Hey. So I got to have meetings. Well, we'll talk about it after this is all you're, you're going to see that, that 1.2, 1 1.5, that, that money's going to go quick. I know, I know. The money's gonna go real quick. Well, we'll get deep into it as buddies afterwards. I don't want to. I don't want to get into it too much. All right, all right, all right. Show here, but let's talk about your uh, uh, your documentary called "Born Again" about Army veterans. Read it. Oh, real? Yeah. Oh no. Uh, well, I don't. <laughs> what did I give you for that? Uh, oh, I gave you a um, the trailer 
And then the Instagram link again, I don't have a poster yet. Um, that, so I worked on that a year and a uh, year and a half ago. Um, I filmed it. Kim, Kim, my girlfriend's brother was a paratrooper and, um, he actually watched gong, but not forgotten. I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, he watched the Johnny blaze documentary and he said, Hey, Johnny I have an blaze. idea. Yeah. That's the one you just pulled up the gong, but not forgotten. So that's my other documentary. Um, and so he watched that and he, he like he was impressed and he was like, Hey, do you want to fly out to Nashville and uh, film? My buddies and I are getting together about a hundred of us for uh, my army, my army company. We're getting together for a weekend retreat that's being paid for by the um, independence fund. And uh, he's, I was like, yeah, you know, I, I, so I went and got two, I went and got two cameras and I had the audio equipment. I got two Panasonic GH fives. And I have my cheap ass um, uh, tripod and, you know, my little makeshift gimbal. And um, basically my, 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 zo my uh, H4N Zoom audio recorder. And these guys, you know, I, I filmed some interviews, but what they're doing is the Independence Fund is getting different companies together for retreats a couple couple weeks out of the month. And. There's so much I, I want to turn this into a show where you, where there's like 10 episodes of different. And so these guys, they all serve together. And a lot of them were still carrying a lot like some grievances. And um, a lot of them were, were still messed up. And, you know, they it was kind of like a, uh, an alternative to the VA in that the VA. They just don't feel like the VA cares, you know, and so them getting together they think that this might be a really good, like they, they're calling it the a silver, the silver, the silver bullet, no pun intended for, um, uh, suicide prevention and, uh, and stuff like that. So, cause these guys were deployed. Yeah. They, they saw, they saw some shit yeah. and they have some yeah. stories. And so I went there for three days, four days, three, like three and a half days. And then I did some follow-up interviews, but I cut together this 80 minute, uh, documentary. And, you know, these stories, I never served, you know, but, but I, I'm no stranger to depression and uh, anxiety. And so like, it was, it really touched me. And I think it's as, you know, as, as much of a, a, into narrative filmmaking as I am screenwriting and stuff, stuff like this, it felt really important. It feels like an important documentary and Sounds I'm going to try to get it out there to some film festivals. You know, I'm, I'm going to introduce, uh, after the show, we'll talk about this. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to my buddy, Mark Maxey, who's producing my movie, he did a uh, several documentaries about soldiers, and he won an Emmy. Oh, really? Yeah. So you okay. should meet him. You should meet him. We'll, yeah. We'll talk I, about I think this isn't about money. This isn't about anything. This is about like, I mean, I didn't do. I they basically gave me enough money to pay for to rent the equipment and pay for the the the, the ticket to fly there and and pay for my hotel, and like you know, I and it took me a year. It took me a year and a half to edit or about a year and yeah, a year and a half to edit because with documentaries, it's different. The story, you got to find the story. Yeah. Um, a script, you, you already have the blueprints, the script. Right. And this was like, I'll go and I'll try to, I had enough confidence from doing the Johnny blaze documentary that I would find a story in there. And, you know, I think there, I think there's a story there. Um, well, you dude, uh, of all the people I've met, I, in this business, um, there are different people take different ways and different routes to get their films made. You are the type of person I've never seen anything like you, dude. You just you just go in, you do it, and you make it happen, and you learn it, and you make it happen yourself. And I fucking love that about you, bro. Oh, I've tried those. Thank you. I've tried those other routes too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we you know the query letters, the cold calls. The, you know, it's, it's depressing. It, no, you know, it is. Just gotta... it, it's brutal. And the way you're doing it, you, you have learned everything yourself. So, you know, editing, I know editing too, but I, I haven't gone to the extent you have. I did it with my short, I do it with my short stuff and all that stuff, but I, I don't, I've, I've never considered doing a feature where I edit the feature. I mean, you I would what? love to be in the room with the editor because I know here's the thing. I feel like an editor, you, they need to be funny, even if it's a drama, because they know timing. 
You know what I mean? You know timing. You're an artist. A lot of people don't know timing. And I've worked, I tried to work with an editor before bragging about all this stuff, but the guy wasn't funny and he didn't get it and he didn't edit my stuff right. So it's like, it's a big thing for me. Sounds anyway, like you need to be an editor. Nah. nah. It's, you know what? Let that down. You know what? You, you, it's a control thing. It's just how much of the project do you want to control? You know, right. like, and, and also like, if you're going to like with me, it's probably a control thing, which not as a bad thing, creative control. So like with, with this movie and the Badger game, you know, we wrote it, we produced it. We were in pre-production, we were in production, we were in post-production, you know, that takes a year and a half, you know, two years. And, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of directors and maybe I'll do this. What if I, if, if I get the chance to direct the movie and then go on to the next one while it's being edited, you know, go on to focus on the next one. But, it just depends on how close you are to the material, how much money you have. If you can't pay an editor, you got to do it. Yeah. And uh, which isn't a bad thing. It's, you know, that's fun. It's just, they're just long. You know, th it's fun. Editing's fun. You know, you get to play around with music and tone, like you said, comedy. If you want the scene to be funny, you can cut it in a way that, that expresses that as long as you have the, the coverage. But it's a control thing, man. You know, how much you of it do you want to... Who do you want? You don't want to blame anybody else. When, when that thing comes out, when that product comes out, you don't want to say, you don't have to blame anybody else. You want to be like, well, if you don't like it, it was my fault. You know? Yeah. 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 So there's account. I guess there's an expect accountability expectation there, you know? Anyway, I don't know. Uh, man, anyway. I, I could talk to you for another hour, bro. Um, it's the finale, baby. It's the finale. You're in the finale. I'm so psyched I get you in here. Um, uh, you got your uh, what's what are you working on now? Before we what, right you, now, yeah. Well, uh, well, I have I have quite a few scripts. Um, so you know the company that we're dealing with, they want you know they 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 like what we're doing. They they came on set a day we were shooting. They were impressed. Uh, you know, we had, we had two cameras go, our, dude, our shoot was 14 days, man. That's no joke. Like wow. that, that was DJ Qualls was, was like, man, the shortest film I, shoot I've been on was 22 days. Dude, that thing was run me and my AD and I, we got into it like every day we got into it. She walked off set four times. I <laughs> kicked her off set twice. We had guys, you know, I mean, and but to be honest, we didn't, we weren't running 18 hour days. We were giving everybody proper turnarounds. We were doing 13 hour days, but man, we were up against it. And I had a great film. I had a great crew. I handpicked that everybody because I just worked on uh, uh, another film that we shot in like eight days. So I'm like, oh, these guys are no stranger to work. So uh, yeah, we just, I hired, you know, the, the camera department and I had some, some, some producers and the uh, art department from that shoot. And I just moved it on over. But man, it was, it was hectic. So, um, why did I say that? Well, okay. So the question was, what, what am I doing next? Well, um, I got a couple projects. So the, the company that, oh, I know what, what I was saying. They came to, they came to set, they were impressed. So strike while the iron's hot, you know, we have, a, we have them wanting to make projects. So I, I, I've already given them two scripts. We'll see which one, you know, sticks. Um, other Where than that, I'll be at. Huh? Where can pe where can people find you, support you, follow you? Um, you know, I, <laughs> you probably gathered from me sharing my stuff on Instagram. I'm, I don't have that. I'm never on Instagram. Um, so like, uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna Tornado Park Films is gonna be. I'm gonna start a web. I'm gonna start a you know website. I just started that for the documentary. But um, you know, just okay people can start watching the badger game and, and gong but not forgotten that's on am those are on amazon and then you know these two movies are coming out uh the documentary and this and the turning point and born again and i don't know man just go you know take the time out to watch you know write a good review on 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 uh i you know on imdb you know or amazon after you watch a movie or you know anything like that i don't know i mean just support, support me, support. It's a, it's a, it's a weird time because, you know, obviously the movies, everything's streaming and nobody knows who to support and what to watch. There's so much content. 
Yeah. So it's 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 tough, man. I mean, don't just support me. I guess support like everybody. Support you. You know, the same people that support me should support you. We should support each other. That's one thing I want to say. You know, you're from New York. I'm from Chicago. Work ethic. And, you know, I think artists shouldn't, you know, they should mean what they do, what they say, say what they mean, do what they're going to do and stick with projects. Everybody in L.A. is so, so finicky, man. They, they jump on, you know, the next thing. But, you know, all it does is it, it, it's it scrambles. It scrambles them. It scrambles people that are working on projects and just stay committed, you know, stay committed to the work. And, you know, that's how you finish projects. Finish projects. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's starting a project. Finish the fucking project. Bro, I I freaking love you, man. I wish we had more time to talk about uh, Johnny the Johnny Blaze thing. Oh, Johnny Blaze. But you know what? That's I'm a gonna great have... documentary. It's sad yeah. and it's funny. Plug I'm going to have, have you back soon. All right, have, have me we're back. Gonna, we're going to take, yeah, we're going to take a three-week hiatus, but I'm going to have you back soon, man. So great okay. to see you, man. All right, Let me too. know when you're back in town and let's, you know, go out and hang out. All right, Danny. It was nice Thanks to meet you, Kevin. On the show, Josh. Thank you. Kevin, Thank are you, you in New York? The show. I am. All right. I noticed that you said the Wu-Tang uh, reference. Shallon. <laughs> I love I love, I love, I love Wu-Tang. Jizz and Liquid Swords. One God, of my favorite albums. Yeah. Dude, I am always impressed by you. I'm always amazed by you. Thank you so much. Let's have you back again soon. Maybe the first of the next season. So, All right. Well, while it's fresh in our memory. Exactly. Stay, stay, look at, stay in touch, bro. I want to, I want to hang out. Okay. All right. Bye guys. All right. Thanks later, for having bye. me on. Thanks man. He's so, dude, that guy is amazing. I mean, I, I'm always blown away by his work ethic. I mean, he's incredible. So. Um, it sounds it sounds to me like he's very, very dedicated to his work. Dude, he's a badass. He's, he's a great writer. He's a great – he's very good at what he does. He's not – you know, he's no bullshit, man. He gets – he he writes, he produces, he gets shit done. And and I'm grateful we, that he had time to be on the show So for the finale, which is great. Now – That is beautiful. Another great – Now, time. we've got one of our favorite guests from any of our guests that we've ever had. The guy, uh, when I first uh, went to the comic strip, I first got into the comic strip, he was one of the nicest guys to me. He didn't, you know, some comics get, get weird about it, but he was totally nice to me. He had no ego, no nothing. He's just incredibly hilarious. And I, I'm grateful to be his friend. He's an actor, comedian. He's one of the funniest stand-up com comics working in the industry today. Please welcome... Brian Scott McFadden. You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Now I'm, I think you're muted. Now I'm, there you was, go. That was, yeah, this is how the chicanery starts on this show. Like you bring someone on and then you pull some technological wizardry so that Danny comes out on top of any interchange, right? Like, like. Yeah, I know how the game works. All right, well, thank you for that lovely uh, intro, uh, by the way. Um, I am egoless. That's right. I have achieved no ego whatsoever. That's a kind of a cool – I'm, I'm finally – people work their entire lives to reach this point where they are now egoless, and so I am finally reached there. So that's, that's, uh, that's pretty – that's pretty good. It's, it's, I just, I'm just still fascinated by Kevin's background. Uh, it's, 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 it's like the pod greenhouse from Invasion of the Body Snatchers or something. Or uh, <laughs> the pool. Or, or, the pool. Yeah. It looks like yeah, the pool looks like the place where the Manson girls killed Wojtek Vykrowski or whatever, or Jay Sebring. <laughs> that looks like where the Manson killings took place there. I don't know what happened. Don't discount but, uh, Tex Winter. What's that? Don't discount Tex Winter. It wasn't just squeaky from, you know. That's that's true. It was Patricia <laughs> Krenwinkel and Susan Atkins. Hey, I know my <laughs> trivia. That I know my cool. trivia. I know my Manson family trivia. You know what I mean? You gotta, <laughs> you gotta stay. You stay. Patricia and and Squeaky. We all know our shit. You know. Uh, why? Why are your books? Why are your books covered in cellophane? Uh, the, the, I'm practicing safe reading, uh, Danny. <laughs> I uh, no. I we're actually we're actually had a at a at some kind of like weird 
We had some weird. Um, well, those are like book condoms, is what I know. I know. I was. I, I thought this was like Zoom, where I could put some kind of virtual thing in the background. But you're forced. I'm basically on this old house. I'm doing some kind of uh, redecorating here, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm at I'm at Lowe's, the you know Lowe's home improvement store, and so they're getting some work done, and so they're painting the uh, ceiling and uh, fixing up a a uh, crashed uh, uh, ceiling situation. Nothing that funny going on. <laughs> I, Where are you living I, now, man? Uh, Upper West Side, same as always. You know. Okay. Same, same, same as always. I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, you know, yeah, I saw the Badger game uh, stuff. That was that was interesting. I have my <laughs> own. Uh, I have my own film uh, called The Wombat Maneuver that's coming out. <laughs> uh, so uh, it was very, we're very excited. And, uh, and, I, and I also, it's a trill, it's a, it's a trilogy, but it's only in two parts. And, uh, it's, it, 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 and the second part is the Muskrat Rebellion. So, uh, you know, so we got the Badger game. Uh, then we can do the Wombat Maneuver, the Muskrat Rod. Just get, get, get him back on the show and uh, ask him if we can, uh, I can be a part of that. Get Josh and back here. Can right? we do a third, a third part called The Possibilities of Possums? Uh, what's that? What's that? <laughs> yes. Can we screen a third part called The Possibilities of Possums? I think it would fit right in. I think I think we've got I think we've definitely got the new uh, Lord of the Rings right there. I think I think we've definitely got Lord of the Rings with small animal references. With mammals. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly, small <laughs> animals. But uh, so what's what's going on? I can't remember what I talked about last time I was on the show. That's and, okay. Uh, Nobody watches yeah. it, so it's all new. And that's good. So it's a win-win for everybody. That's a good, exactly. that's a good way to look at it. No one watches our show, so nothing matters. Okay, welcome to the nihilism hour. Okay, that's it's good. existentialism at the very mountaintop. Yeah, absolutely, it, it's a fatalism. Let's just kill ourselves right now, right here on the air. It'll be a awesome story to tell our, uh, our our the kids that we don't have. But uh, but no, but you know, okay, no, but seriously. Yeah. Um, when I, when I got in at the comic strip, because I knew Richie, Richie liked me, you're, you're one of the comics that you didn't like comics get jealous when a new comic gets into a club. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some it's comics. A, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a natural defense for many comedians. It's a natural defensive maneuver. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a defense mechanism of, of living in abject terror. Right. <laughs> that, that, that comedians <laughs> do that we that we basically do on a daily, that is the hell that is our every momentary uh, moment alive existence. Yes. Yes. That someone will come around and take our spots from us, you know? So, yeah. yes. But you didn't care. You were nice to me from the very get go. And yeah, that's what I know. I it's that kind of, that's the kind of shit that's really hurt my career. I got to say that right <laughs> now. It's really, it's really put a kibosh on any of a lot of my upward mobility. People go, People go, hey, Brian, why are you not ahead? Because I don't have the ruthless sociopathic, you know, you know, thing that that because I actually have feet, have a heart and a soul, and I care about people, and that is not going to get you very far in this industry. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's just, no. uh, you, you know, know what? That's 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 exactly the opposite. It will get you far. It yeah, will get you true. far. Eventually, it does. Yes, yes. Yeah, because yes, I, I mean, seriously, dude. The only reason that. Um, I'm getting stuff done. I, I we'll catch up. I can't really talk about it now, but we'll we'll talk about it. But the only the only reason, no, you I mean can't, I can't, can't though. Can't because, talk about it now. You've managed to weave in dropping. Uh, I love I love when Danny casually mentions numbers of his, of his film budgets. That's one of my favorite part of the show. That's the the whole thing. Just I don't know. Most people drop names of people like celebrities. No, uh, somehow Danny managed to stick in. <laughs> Uh, how much his film uh, budget has rocketed to, or something? Like I'm that. probably like, in deep shit already. You're making it worse. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to help, Danny. I just trying to. I try. I just want to get all of your accounting books on the record, right, so that everyone knows what's going on. You know. No, but you know the weird thing is when you're when you're getting a movie produced, everybody's worried about. Don't say anything. Don't say this. Don't say that. And I get it. I get it. It's true. But it's like uh, my whole point was surrounding yourself with good people and being a good person, I think, yeah. is the only is the best way to really get shit done. Because when you're petty and when you're, uh, you know, when you backstabbing and all that kind of stuff, that shit yeah. gets around and you yeah. don't get anything done. You know what yeah, I mean? What's, did, I, did I tell that story, the Marx Brothers story about Chico last time? 
No. I was on the show. I don't even know. But it, that's my favorite thing about the Marx Brothers is like, it, do you hear about the Marx Brothers? And supposedly, and I don't know if this is a cautionary tale or an inspiring story. I can't even tell anymore because show business. But it's like supposedly, <laughs> I'm not even sure what it is to say. Yeah, I can't do both. It can be both. It's that that's the paradox of show business. It's what I love and hate the most about it. But uh yeah, Groucho was really smart. Um uh the, the guy Gummo was like the business manager guy. Zeppo was like, you know, the ladies' man or whatever. Groucho and, and Groucho was like really intelligent and uh, Harpo was a sweetheart. Everybody loved Harpo. But the guy that got him all their deals was Chico because he was the gambler that was always at the whorehouses and he was always drunk. With the with the heads of the studios partying with them in a in, you know what I mean he'd be living with Louis B Mayer at a at a crap table somewhere with like hookers and you know he got and he was friendly and and everybody loved him because the the debauchery and everything and he was the guy that got them all their big deals because he was always passed out in a dumpster with somebody <laughs> from from 20th Century Fox or something like that or whoever you know. Well, so a Ziploc bag of smack is the key to success. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to say, Kevin. It's all about that. It's all about the. It's all about the. You know the uh, uh, hookers and blow. That's really that's where it's gonna. That's where all the deals are made. You know. Well, I mean, I think I hear business is like that with golf, and you know what I mean. Golf is like always like, but you hear so many things about it. most people get jobs in show business. From the connections they make, the friends they have, the people they did favors for, the people that they connected with were were nice to, and you know, and all you can be is like as sincere and and uh, open hearted as you can be, and hopefully it'll come back to you somewhere. The nineteenth hole is a body part. Just saying. What's that? The nineteenth yeah, hole it, is a body part. Yes, it's it, yeah, that, it, it certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> well said, my friend. Well, well said. Arnold no, but Thomas, I mean, uh, seriously, I, I really believe that sincerity is is key to to um, I mean, see, look, you got to have talent, but there, there's fake, so many and people. When can, and when you can fake that, you got it made. Exactly. exactly. That's yeah. Groucho right there, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, uh, you can fake it or you can not fake it. You can you can gen genuinely connect with people. And it's one of the things I, I try to tell people every day. I mean. You, 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 yeah, but you're, you're, you're over, you're like, uh, you're like open heartedly vulnerable and just like gushingly sweet, Danny. And well, I don't know, I, what, I, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I care about people. I, I yeah. look at, I, when I was a kid, I was picked on, right, in my whole freaking life, you know, and, and I had a tough, my father was, I mean, I, I don't, my, I love my dad, but he was, he was a little bit too much, you know, and, yeah. uh, so yeah. I had a really, really difficult childhood, and and it was funny because when I when I got out and I started to get in the entertainment business, and I people saw I had talent with acting. Mm -hmm. uh, then I tried to get into comedy and stuff like that, and I, I had all these pitfalls because I'm trying to be a good person, but at the same time, sometimes I brag too much or I talk too much when I was young, and I'm right. just you know it's it's a it. But when it comes down to it, it's not about. The bravado it's about the connection with people mm -hmm. yeah you know what i mean yeah. and 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 you and i you we've struggled our whole freaking lives in this business yeah and and uh you know what i think kevin? It, what about hey, kevin hasn't had it easy either Oh, Kevin gave, up, Kevin gave up. Kevin gave up a long time ago i'm no, trying to I finish know. the <laughs> I, 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 I understand but we can't leave we got to rope kevin into this uh look at look at that Look at that greenhouse effect he's had, he's got had <laughs> in his background there. <laughs> the, 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 the tropical uh, the tropical rainforest uh, hut that he's living in. Yeah. So, well, no wait wait. Yeah. I want to talk about what you're working on right now, Brian. Let's talk about let's talk about what you're working on. Now you uh, were, yeah you were in this secret life of Walter Mitty with Ben Stiller. <laughs> yes, I was. That yes, was not recent, that. but let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that, that that's one of those things that I that uh, you know. Uh, one of those movies. The, I don't know what. I don't even remember. I don't even know how that happened. Basically, I auditioned for something, and, and <laughs> I really don't. I really, honestly don't. And Ben really liked me, and he said, "Let me put you in some part." He had me read for like three different roles. Then end up playing a guy at the airport who uh, kind of interrogates him. And uh, I was all. I had a bigger part in the trailer uh, than in the actual film. <laughs> ended up, like no, no. I was. Uh, um, if you watch the trailer for the movie, it's really funny. 
because when we saw the trailer, I was like, oh my god, my they 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 used my whole role or whatever. It was it was like I don't know. I had like uh, eight lines or whatever it was, and uh, and then uh, in the trailer, I I think I'm the last voice you hear in the trailer or something like that. So that's kind of cool. But then the movie came out and I was like smaller. You know, they cut you down. Uh, as I said, I think on the last time I was on the show, they always cut. And Ben told me, you know, you were great, but we, we had to cut it for time and everything else and continuity. And I said, I, uh, and it was a, it's, it's a great lesson because I said, I wrote a bit about it because I said, uh, yeah, if you, if you saw The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, it, was, it started out bigger and it was cut, you know. Uh, but uh, that's why people get into porn. Because that never <laughs> happens in porn, you know what I mean? That's one of the motivations to get into porn. I always encourage young actors, if, you, if you're afraid of being cut out of film, do more porn. Because you never have to worry, you never have to worry about that awkward conversation with the producer <laughs> who's going to walk in and go, listen, Brian, we love you at Eruption Films, but, uh, you know... <laughs> But we have to say that uh, your role in Two Girls, One Comic, uh, you know, we, uh, we did, I'm sorry, but your role as the assistant pizza delivery guy did not really flesh out the protagonist's backstory. So, uh, so we, we had to trim your role down, but we hope to work with you more in the future. It's not, it has nothing to do. You're a great talent and we see you uh, doing many uh, porn films in the future and we look forward to a long working career with you but unfortunately that's that doesn't happen yeah that doesn't happen in porn so get into porn and you'll never have that awkward conversation you know you got to make some career moves uh getting cut from a film or just getting your role cut you know it's like it's like just it's just one of those things that can happen you know well you uh, but you I'm know still in it. but yes i'm still in it yes you can see me in it and I well, loved you, Ben. It was a great, it was a great opportunity, and, and Ben was great too. Uh, are you still in touch with Ben at all? Um, I, 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 well, I came to the premiere. When I came to the premiere, he was really sweet to me. And uh, if I saw him, he'd, 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 we'd, we'd bond over um, the Buzzcocks and uh, and and uh, childhood TV shows because we sort of both grew up in show business with show business parents. His dad was obviously, you know, still Ramirez and. My dad was Bob McFadden, who was, you know, Frankenberry and did a lot of classic comedy records and was on the Thundercats. So we, we you know, we had, we sort of had that in common of growing up with a with a show business uh, show business background. His his parents obviously more famous than, than my dad's, but nonetheless the same the same type of you know uh, pitfalls as well as uh, beautiful rewards that come from something like that. Why don't you tell us more about your dad? I, I, I've always been fascinated. You, you loved your dad and you talk about him. You post about him. Uh, yeah. I'd love to hear more about him. Uh, my, well, you know, every comic has, I mean, every male comic uh, probably has uh, daddy issues, you know. And my dad was this, uh, was this uh, brilliant, like, um, voice actor. He could do any voice in the world and he, he was so good at it. And I would stand and, and watch him in awe and uh, and as much as he 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 probably, you know, my father was 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 one of those people that wanted to be a good dad, but didn't really know how to do that, you know, like like <laughs> like he was just sort of like, but he had the eagerness to do that. But my father would like sort of act the part of the dad that he wanted to be, like, uh, what are you doing there, son? You know. Uh, he he would like he would like do stuff that like he saw on TV that would work. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you want me to teach you how to ride that bike, Brian? You know, like like and and uh, I'd be like, and uh, and then but he'd get really nervous and flustered if it didn't go well because he wanted he was a perfectionist about everything, including being a dad. And so we had like we had that relationship, that strained kind of relationship that that uh, some that guys have with their father. Your father's this mythical unknowable behind a glass case kind of um, uh, vision that you have. And I just idolized and adored my dad. And I got some great gifts from him and was wounded by him because he was, he was a performer. And those people like that have, you know, narcissistic wounds. You know, my father was a big show off. He was like the star of the room, you know. And when I would do stuff, he couldn't help but notice that I was good and he would be sort of grudgingly complimentary. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is stuff I've talked about in therapy incessantly. So this is nothing new, you know, 
Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it was stuff that wounded me as well as made me better. Like I never would have been as good at what I do um, as, as, as I would have been if it hadn't been for my dad, because he set a standard. He also taught me so many things about show business and just how to do voices. And, and just, my father was such a great laugher. If you got him laughing, it was like the greatest thing in the world. And so we always knew the sweet spot and I could always make my father laugh with certain things that I could do and other things he just wouldn't, you know, I remember, and, 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 you know that moment where you want your dad to laugh at something and then they say something negative or critical and it just oh, yeah. breaks it breaks your heart as a child, yep. you know, like 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 I think I told my father I think I did a Woody Allen impression for my dad and uh and uh I did uh it is it's kind of something you probably not politically correct, but I was young and <laughs> it was well, like back then back then it was fine. Yeah, exactly. It's like, I, I think it was something about Woody Allen and Soon Yi or something. I can't remember the joke. I, I, well, I wasn't that young, but but it was like, you know, um, um, I'm, you know I'm, I've always been attracted to, you know, Asian women. You know, it's like uh, I, I, my dream, my fantasy is to have sex with Soon Yi on the top of the Vietnam Memorial. You know, or like, like, like okay, that, so, so <laughs> just, just it's like, I don't even know like what that joke even means or something. And my father just goes, Vietnam, you're going to do a joke about Vietnam. Is that, is that it? Right? Like, like, and I'm like, dad, the joke's not about Vietnam. He's like, well, you go ahead and see if that works for you. Cause that's a, you know, people are sensitive about Vietnam. I think we got over Vietnam. Dad. You know what I mean? Like that is my father wanted, you know, he was, he was that guy who would, he, he knew about comedy. So he never knew where the line was to be like the critic who could say something, you know, that was insightful and, but also also had an old school kind of thing where he was more in his own head about what his, his idea of what was funny was. So we would kind of like, sometimes he could be his inability to like go to where I was and to recognize you're not, you're my dad. You're not Siskel and Ebert here. Dad. You know what I mean? Like, like, right. like right. you know, I'm just telling you this and sharing this cause I want to, you know, bond with you. But uh, well, you're, hey, you're gonna do a you know Vietnam joke? Is that is that where we're going? You know. <laughs> well, you know what? To be honest with you, you're lucky because my dad, uh, he was a great storyteller, and he'd have the whole family laughing. And um, but with me, from when I was like seven years old, he wanted me to be an, an engineer. He wanted me to make money, so right. he was he made me take German. Yeah. Back when I was in seventh grade. And I'll never forget it because I wanted to take French to be near the chicks. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, German, and he was like, no, no, and, German specifications. Yeah. Uh, and the Germans are hilarious. Yeah. They're known for their comedy over there. Germany, there's right. nothing. Boy, you watch those Third Reich newsreels, though, it's a laugh riot, <laughs> right? So that, that was a country that knows how to laugh. I'll tell right, you. Right, right. You know? Well, my, yeah. my, my father didn't until after my mother died. Uh, he, he, he didn't support me. And after my mother died, he goes, I wanted to say, I'm sorry. Oh. And I go, really? He goes, he goes, yeah, I knew you were a good actor, but I, I knew you could be a world-class engineer and blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And, but he, but he said, because he had to talk with my brothers. This is true. I, w I was, uh, producing something. Uh, we had just interviewed Penny Marshall and and uh, Billy Bob Thornton, and we're trying to get clean water to children all over the world, whatever. And um, I was out on the street. My father said, I, I just want to apologize. I go, for what? He goes, well, I was talking to your brother today, my older brother, and he's like, I, uh, I kept telling him how you could have been such a big engineer and changed the world and blah, blah, blah. And then your brother said to me, but dad, he didn't want to. And then he goes, and that's when I realized he was right. You didn't want to, and I should have supported you. So, when you were born and when I was born and when you were born, Brian, someone handed them a book about fathering that said, withhold your approval. Now get out. Yes, 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 yes. That's yeah. very, yeah, that was very, you know, that trauma gets passed on to the next generation, the next generation to stop the, the, the flow of that. So, and, and the funny part is like, Danny, your father wanted you to be an engineer. Uh, you know, my, and so you didn't have that kind of thing that I had with, with my dad, but I was injured in a different way because everybody gets 
you get screwed somewhere along the line by, you know, a parent's dysfunction or a wounding, not because they're bad or they, they intend anything, but because they're just wounded themselves. And so what I got from my father was like a, a kind of like a, ro- a bit of a role model of like how to succeed in show business. But when it came to like getting him to like, I remember I gave him a play to read. I, I read a, I, I, maybe I talked about this. Like I, I, I wrote a play when I was nine. Okay. Really? I, was in, I was in the Cub Scouts, right? <laughs> I think, and I wrote a play that the, our, our Cub Scout leader was the, the the guy, the father of one of the kids was uh was Mr. Kennelly, and I wrote a play called The Plot to Murder Mr. Kennelly, right, which was like, like about a bunch of Cub Scouts who look really innocent and they decide to bump off their scout leader, their, you know, the scout master guy. And, and so there's like, it's Cub Scout meeting, they all have their little hats and the uniforms and they're going, let's, let's make popsicles. And you know what I mean? And then the, the adults leave and then they pull down a, a big like chart and then they plant, they have this murder, they take off their hats and they're these like really <laughs> ruthless, you know, Machiavellian murder plot thing. And and I, this was I was nine years old, and there's a thing I still remember to this day. This you, wait, 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 wait! You were nine years old, and you wrote a murder. Yeah, like Mar- no, I, think I, I want, I want no. Danny to talk about the budget for this film. Yeah, yeah, da- yeah, Danny. I want to remake this. I want. Yeah, stop wanna, talking wanna, about it now because people are going to steal it. Let's talk about it after yeah, the show. Yes, let's He's work gonna, on this shit. I, I don't want Josh to hear about this. He's going to weave it into the Badger game, right? Okay, so <laughs> the sequel or whatever, but. uh <laughs> no, but I, so where was I? Oh, I, so, um, but there's a thing in the play that still makes me laugh to this day. I've never forgotten it. And this was like, I don't know if you've ever been in therapy, there are certain seminal moments that you describe over and over again that basically reframe and and, and define your childhood, like interactions with your parents that, that stick out in your mind as something that represented this, 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 this mythical epoch thing this 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 mono myth of what your relationship with your with your parents was so i hand my father the play and there's a scene at the beginning of the play one of that we're plotting to murder this guy and <laughs> don't ask me and and <laughs> and one of the kids goes i got i gotta go to the bathroom and he leaves right and he doesn't come back for the entirety of the play right <laughs> like you know like like okay and then we kill Mr. Canelli. I think we throw him in a ditch or something. I don't remember all the plot points. It was not that long. It was like probably 15 pages or something like that. And then we kill him. And then we're like, yeah, it was all done. And then out of the bathroom comes this kid who's been in the bathroom for the entire play. And he go, and we go, where have you been all this? Where have you been? He goes, I went to the bathroom. You've been in the bathroom all this time? Yeah, we were out of toilet paper. All right, that that's the joke. That's a, nine, that's a nine-year-old joke right there. Okay, now now I love that joke because first of all, it's meta that the guy, an actor, I've never seen a play where a guy disappears at the beginning of the play for has like one line. He goes to one line. He disappears for the entirety of the play. This was I don't think I don't think Ibsen thought of this. I don't think I don't I've seen it. You know what I mean? Like like. I don't think Chekhov did this in any of his plays. A guy, a guy leaves the stage. He comes back at the end just out of nowhere. You've totally forgotten he was in the play. And then he announces it again. And it's not even a shit joke, really, because it's not even scatological. Because it leaves it to the audience's imagination of what the hell that even means. You know, that's what I loved about it, right? Right. So it's, a meta, it's a meta joke. He just goes... Uh, you've been in there the whole time? Yeah, we're out of toilet paper. Like, let the audience picture whatever the hell <laughs> horror show that means. Well, I wrote that. That's the end of the joke. That's the end of the play. It goes, yeah, we're out of toilet paper. Like, wah, 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 you know, boy. End of, and my father goes, out of toilet paper? <laughs> like that, you're at that's funny right like and i and i'm nine and i literally started arguing with my father and trying to explain to him why that was funny for like a like a, you know dad don't you understand you don't see the joke coming because it's you don't understand i'm, I'm like uh, i'm arguing you know comedic uh, you know the principles of comedy with my dad who's like you know <laughs> and 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 i rem- and it was and he handed the play back to me and I walked away like devastated. Like I just, oh, I remember man. that. Like I was just cr- crushed. Oh. That, you know, it, because you just want an attaboy. You just want, you wrote a play. You don't want 
uh, you know, this the the second half could be weaker. There's as I really didn't buy that character. <laughs> hey, Dad, I wrote a fucking play. I'm nine. You know what I mean? Nine, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. So, so yeah, so that that's one of those like little mini traumas that you just go, oh my god, this guy's unpleasable. You know? Yeah. And then and then when I became a comedian, he was much more. Um, enthusiastic and supportive but it, but the problem is with that and anybody that has come to some kind of rapprochement with a parent will tell you this because at that point i didn't need it at that point right, right. Like he, he was right. finally being complimentary he was like and i was like yeah but i needed you back then i'm already damaged now right like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like you would damage me and now you're coming in at the end going yeah uh, like you know people always have this thing with my father if my, only my father had told me he loved me at the end, you know what I mean? That everything would have been great. And I'm like, no, not really. I no. mean, maybe, maybe, but that damage has been done. You needed to hear that then. That child needed to hear that. And it's no, it's not your your pain is is not your fault, but your healing is your responsibility. So I'm right. not blaming my father. You know, you know, saying saying my father messed up because he was damaged. He had a horrific shit childhood, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and so he gave me a better childhood than he had. And so that's what you really sort of, that's the building blocks that you want. Like, like look, give me a slightly less horrific childhood than you. You know what I mean? Like, like so that we can maybe move the species on and make some, uh, 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 progress but uh I, yeah i always say i always i always say i always say that my son is a mini me without all the trauma yeah 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 exactly. you know what i mean yeah did he give you any advice either of you either of you huh. get any advice from your dads yeah I, I mean he he my dad when he was in the mentor role where he was able to demonstrate his um knowledge and 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 sort of greatness because he was really brilliant my dad was like like he could do any voice and the thing that made him great was like my father knew voices and he would he could help me with voices that was where he was really good like he would tell me but but my father had such a catalog of voices from old newsreels and and you know things that he knew actors from movies that no one would ever remember and and he could do I, think, I don't even know if I, maybe I, this usually comes up when people talk about me that because he uh, like I, I had an audition for a, a coach, a voiceover, a voiceover for a, a football coach. And my dad goes, uh, do, uh, do, do, I can't remember the actor's name. And he goes, uh, do, do uh, that, this guy. And I go, who's that, Dad? And he goes, he was in all these old movies. He always was like, eh, we gotta go in there and hit him low and hit him hard, and you and you gotta fight, 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 and you gotta get it. He sounded like an old Ted Baxter, you know, kind of Ted Knight <laughs> character, you know. I, 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 it's, I'm blanking out on the guy's name, but he was like, do, oh God, it'll hit me. I can't remember. But he was in a movie. He was in um, That's My Boy with uh, Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. You know, oh, that's wow. my boy. That's my boy. And my father knew, he yeah, could yeah. do my father did these dead on accurate voices of characters. My father, one time I had to do a constable, a British constable. He goes, do E.E. E. Clive. And I go, who the hell is E.E. E. Clive? And my father goes, he's in every Wolfman, uh, Invisible Man movie. He's the constable with the bobby hat. And he always has the same thing to say. He, he shows up and there's a dead body and he goes, it, it, what's going on, it? You know, <laughs> it, 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 what's going? And, then the, and then the wolf man would jump out or there'd be a dead body or someone was murdered or something. Oh, you know, and my, it, it, what's going on, it? And my father would teach me like voices like that. So yeah, I got, I got some great gifts from my dad, you know, as, as well as uh, wounding and, and, and heartbreak. Well, so, Brian, uh, you're phenomenal. You're a phenomenal talent. And, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just grateful. You're my friend and I'm grateful that, uh, I, I, where can people find you? Uh, as soon as you tell me how much your latest movie costs, uh, I will, I will reveal, <laughs> I will reveal, do more name dropping of, of fun dropping, whatever. Oh, anyway, I didn't drop names. I didn't drop dropping. Names. Danny McDermott in budget dropping, right? Uh, you know, we <laughs> just hired an editor. It's a, we got to point a, put another point five on the freaking budget uh, for my latest film that I got rolling out. And then the sound guy's going to cost me another 
250 grand. So, you know what I mean? The investors. No, no guy costs that much for that budget. Uh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, the point is, the point is you can find me on, uh, on, on social media at uh, B Scott McFadden, uh, on Twitter and, uh, and, 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 and in Danny's next movie, and also uh, the Muskrat Rebellion or whatever that was called that we said, and the Wombat Renewer, <laughs> the Wombat Renewer, and the and the and the Panda Express, I believe, is uh, Requiem uh, uh, for a Weasel. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I love you, man. Dialectic. Thanks, Brian. Brother. You're awesome, you. man. This was a great podcast, great finale, and you know what, my just so you know, my whole team. Loved you. The, you. You're one of you're one of our favorite guests we've ever had. Uh, if you guys uh, watching, go back to Brian's last show. He literally came on and totally lambasted the first half of the show in a hysterical yeah. way. Yeah, I have no well, idea what I said, but uh, it, it, supposedly it was uh, room, word on the street. Uh, the rumor mill says it was it was it was called. Uh, um, Light and amu brilliantly amusing by some critics, I, I think, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> run, run the ticker, run the ticker, Susanna. Uh, you guys got to support us. Please check out Brian. Uh, check out all our shows. This is our finale. Brian, I'm grateful. I pushed you. I know I pushed you so hard to be on the show, but I'm grateful that you did it. Uh, uh, what women want? Tell people yeah. about that before we go. I'm not even sure if that's still available. <laughs> it's like a Bob Dylan out of print record. I, I, I think it's like uh, I have to I have to look into that. I, I I haven't been paying much attention. I've been like kind of doing construction here, as you can Where see. Where can people get your newest stuff then? Uh, my newest stuff is on this show. Just to just tape this <laughs> over and over Where again. Where can they find out what color paint you've chosen? Yeah, that that go to <laughs> go to go to your local Sherman Williams. I'll be appearing there uh, from Saturday the nineteenth uh, on a drop doing, cloth near you. Yeah, at a drop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, at a drop cloth near you. That's perfect. On that note, thank you, Brian. Thank right, you. Guys. Let's roll those credits. Boom! Thank you, guys. Nope. Uh. <laughs>